Welcome to the place where we gain knowledge through the lens of creativity. I am Aaron Dworkin, and this is Artful Science. Thanks again for joining me here on Artful Science. Today's show is Origins, the Peopling of North America. And my guest is Jennifer Raff, who serves as Associate Professor in Anthropology at the University of Kansas. Jennifer, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very excited to be with you. So I am so excited to talk about this topic. You know, I've uh, the kind of origin of people and our backgrounds has always fascinated me. I have a whole crazy background because I was adopted and my birth families and adoptive families are different cultures and, and all of that. So I've just always fascinated in some ways with ancestry. Um, and so I feel like I've got kind of, you know, a rudimentary understanding of what anthropology is and separately very rudimentary understanding of what genetics is. But you are really an anthropological geneticist, or in some ways, or you're able to look at these things through anthropological genetics. What on earth is that? Can you just help us to understand what you're doing and why it's important? Yeah, sure. Um, it's a mouthful, isn't it? Anthropological genetics. Um, what it basically means, it boils down to, I try to understand where people come from using the tools of genetics, but asking anthropological questions and taking an anthropological approach, which integrates the fields of archaeology, biological anthropology, um, sometimes indigenous studies, and a variety of other approaches. Um, it's a very integrative field, and we just try to take a holistic approach to asking one major question, which is, where did humans come from and how did we get to the places we are today? Right. So and it really is fascinating. And, and am I correct in basically understanding that because of the genetic piece of it, what were what the the information and, and conclusions you're arriving at are not theoretical. They're not. Well, we think this may have. But but it's actually because we see this these genetic traces, we know factually this group of people were here, moved towards here, or came from this area. Is that, would that be an accurate um, understanding? Well, it's, yeah, it's yes and no. I'm going to hedge a bit. It's a bit complicated, right? Because DNA can tell you some things. It can tell you who you're closely related to and who you're less closely related to. And you can do a lot of modeling and um, other things to estimate when events may have happened, like gene flow between two populations, uh, migrations, genetic bottlenecks. And you can kind of tie those to events in the archaeological record. But it's tricky to do that. And so there's a lot that we still find um, really open-ended. And, and so we have to kind of go to other fields and say, okay, archaeologists, we see this signal in DNA. Can you tell us what that might mean um, or, or other related fields? So right now there is there are a lot of open questions about human history that genetics is, is helping fill in the gaps, but we don't have a perfect understanding or a uh, concrete understanding of a lot of things. Gotcha, gotcha. So very helpful. So, um, so kind of given this this overall process, and of course, all of this makes me think about you know my twenty three and me that I did, or those types of things to try to you know track some of my own personal ancestry. Um, but given this kind of scientific process that you have. Could you help us to understand what we know about the world in general? And what I mean is I want to kind of eventually get to the Americas, but start with the world in general. Where, where did humans, modern day humans, you know, kind of start on the planet? What, what do we know about the origination of humans on the planet? Very good question. Um, so we know that from genetics, from archaeological data, from um, fossil data, that humans originated in Africa. Um, that modern day humans, or what we would call anatomically modern humans, humans that look like us, it's 
not a great phrase, but that's what we're using these days. Humans that look like us originated in Africa and maybe made a few forays out of Africa here and there um, a couple of hundred thousand years ago. The archeological evidence and the um, fossil evidence is still very much an open question. They're still finding new discoveries every year to kind of push that date back a little bit earlier. But the main um, peopling out of Africa occurred uh, a bit later than that. And that's the one that kind of resulted in hu humans like us, anatomically modern humans, peopling the globe and in a series of migrations that brought us into contact with other kinds of humans that were there previously, descended from earlier hominins like Homo erectus. Um, and these other kinds of humans we know of today as Neanderthals, and Denisovans, our ancestors interbred with them. They met up with them, they encountered them, and they had children with them. And we can detect that in our DNA, which is really exciting. And one of the most fascinating discoveries of the last uh, couple of decades is that, that interbreeding. So many of us carry this genetic legacy in our DNA, including myself. I have a lot of Neanderthal DNA. Um, and so for the purposes of my research and what I'm most interested in, humans, uh, anatomically modern humans made it into Siberia during a period called the Upper Paleolithic. And there they were able to push past the Arctic Circle and actually live above the Arctic Circle. And they developed um, technological adaptations to live that far north um, by about 40,000, 30,000 years ago. So in between that, that period, so quite early. Um, and it was from there that we see these really interesting events that occurred um, that happened during a period of climactic change called the last glacial maximum when the earth cooled globally and became very, very dry. And it's during the last glacial maximum or the LGM that we see the formation of the ancestors of Native Americans, that population genetically. Um, and that's kind of where my story starts, the research that I'm interested in. Right, so this is, and you've just, right, I mean, just, I could spend hours on this because it's, it's so extraordinary and, and fascinating. And also, just before we get to, to kind of the uh, Americas, the, um, when you referenced that there was, um, you know, this intersection with other former human forms that, that came out of from Africa, is there um, a sense of what percentage of people today, for example, have Neanderthal, um, you know, DNA that that shows that that you know kind of intersection occurred in the past. Do we have a sense of what percentage of people have that? You know, I can't remember the latest numbers on that, but it is pretty high. I mean, I think if you have ancestry from populations that were out that have lived outside of Africa, so ancestry from Asian populations, European populations, Native American populations, you definitely have Neanderthal ancestry. And some people with exclusively African ancestry do as well, showing how um, these uh, these genetic variants spread across the globe, right? It, it further reinforces the really critically important idea that people need to know that there's no such thing as a pure population. And both ancient DNA and modern DNA show us that human genetic variation, instead of thinking of it as these, um, well, these, these categories, racial categories, essentially, really what gen human genetic variation shows us is that we're all mixtures of, of many different ancestries and um, that this ancestry is, is um, spread, distributed in a, what we call a clinal pattern, mostly across the planet. That is gradual changes in the frequencies of different genetic variants. Wow. And, you know, I think that's so important just beyond our historical understandings, but just to give context to sometimes these man-made concepts we come up with these days of divisions that understanding historically how how meaningless they are actually biologically for us yes. is I think such an important context. So the Americas, so a lot of times people are like, you know, I always hear people, you know, making jokes with, oh, you know, originally, you know, uh, America discovered by Christopher Columbus and, you know, comedians will say, how do you discover something where there's already people there? And then people are like, so Native Americans and Native Americans were, you know, originally here and people, but now as we can actually understand 
how did that occur and how did the migration into the Americas occur that initially built the foundation for Native Americans here? Right. Um, so this story has changed a lot in recent decades. So most people, if you're kind of my age or, or, or a bit older, you learned the story probably that people came across the Bering Strait relatively recently, about, you know, 13,000 years ago. And they kind of raced across the Bering Strait and, and traveled um, between the two massive glaciers that covered North America um, during the Ice Age or the last glacial maximum. And people the Americas then, you know, southward through the interior of the continent very, very quickly. And that these were big game hunters. They had these really impressively made spear points that are known as Clovis points. And that was it. That's the story. But um, in, I would say, you know, 20, 30 years ago, there started to be archaeological disputes about this. So a number of sites that predate what we call the Clovis culture. Um, which is about 13,000 years ago is the latest dates for it. Uh, they've been started popping up all over the place. And so a lot of archaeologists were gradually questioning this model. And genetics further reinforced that this model is not a good explanation for the origins of Native Americans, that in fact, we have a much more complicated biological history that dates back even earlier than people really appreciated. And as we get more and more genomes, the, the dates for the earliest peoples in the Americas kind of get keep getting pushed back earlier and earlier. So right now, it's a big area of active research as to exactly when were people first here in the Americas. Uh, and you will ask any two archaeologists, you'll get different answers. Um, and in fact, a lot of Native Americans themselves have um, their own histories of being in the Americas very, very, very early, if not always. Um, and so there's a lot of really interesting dialogue going on right now in the field between different experts from different fields trying to piece together this puzzle. And genetics is showing us um, a really complicated history, uh, which is making this, this very exciting um, time to work in this field. Gotcha. So it is fascinating. And so as of kind of today, What's, you know, either our best guess or best understanding of, uh, of two sides of it, I guess, when do we think is the earliest that, say, you know, North America was peopled? Um, and even though it may have been earlier, were they still coming from Siberia and kind of these ancient North Siberians? Or is there any possibility they came from anywhere else in terms of our origins? Right. That's yeah, that's a really good question. So I would say there are kind of three schools of thought here right now. Um, so the the first school of thought, which I think is probably um, the, the more conservative archaeologists would subscribe to is that people were here not much earlier than Clovis, right, that the earliest sites probably date to around 13,000, 14,000 years ago, and that they're found in Alaska, and that these very early sites, they, that's where they anchor their, their models on, that people probably came here a little bit, you know, earlier than Clovis, but not by much, right? And people, the America, in a, the America's in a similar way to what I just described. So it's kind of a, a, a neo-Clovis first kind of view, but not really, it's a little bit earlier. The major, then, the, then the other extreme are some archaeologists who believe that people were here very, very early. I mean, really early, absurdly early almost, like 100,000 years ago, 130,000 years ago. That's a very small proportion of the archaeologists. And they look at sites which most archaeologists do not think are real sites. Um, so, you know, we put that out there. It, the, the data have been published, but most people question that as being um, really legitimate, just because that would have predated most of, of humanity, uh, anatomically modern humans actually migrating out of Africa, right? Some of these early sites. So the majority of people in this field, archaeologists and geneticists really um, would say that people were here anywhere between about 16,000 years ago to maybe even as early as 20,000, maybe even 25,000 years ago. So pushing it a little bit into the last glacial maximum. I would say of that group, the majority of them are probably more in the 16, 17, 18,000 range is where we start to see 
um, the genetics and archaeological data provide the most support. But there are lots of gaps in the genetic record and lots of gaps in the archaeological record that lead us to wonder, it, you know, what is the actually the earliest origins of people? So the majority of Native American ancestry or the first peoples, as I, I prefer to call them, comes from um, a population that was in East Asia uh, with then the addition of gene flow from another population. And they met up sometime around 20, 25,000 years ago somewhere. We don't know exactly where. We don't actually have good archaeological evidence of where that interaction took place. But a lot of us have think that it have, was in the southern region of central Beringia, which would have been, you know, the Bering Strait area. If you can think of it more as a lost continent than as a land bridge, that kind of helps give you an idea that people were li possibly living there for thousands of years. And that's where we see the emergence of the ancestors of the first peoples of the America genetically. Other archaeologists would say, no, no, they, they actually originated in Siberia. That's more likely. And so this is a big uh, dispute in our field right now. Well, it's just so fascinating. And I think one of the things that I really take away too is just this rich and extraordinary history that we have um, in terms of the origins of, of people in, in North America. And, and that context, I think, can help inform how we think about things today. Uh, too. So, well, this is fantastic. Unfortunately, we are just about out of time, but I always like to ask all of our guests here on Artful Science, where we're at the intersection of arts and sciences, do you have any either artistic practice you do yourself or just um, aspect of the arts that you love to appreciate? I do. I am a lifelong martial artist, so <laughs> a little awesome. bit different, right? Yeah, so awesome. not musical necessarily, but I have trained in the martial arts since I was six years old. Um, I've had a brief hiatus for the last few years while I had a baby and kind of was very busy, but I'm picking it back up again, so training again. So oh, That's phenomenal. And do you mind my asking what form? Uh, of uh, several. <laughs> yeah. So I started out in Taekwondo, um, which is Korean martial art. And from there, I started cross training in um, a number of different arts. My favorite, probably my two favorites are Muay Thai kickboxing and Kali or Eskrima, which is stick fighting from the Philippines. Um, I absolutely love those arts. And they really are arts. I mean, the, it, it is um, a very physical, um, but really fun um, artistic practice, I think. So. Absolutely. Well, that's so wonderful to hear. And I myself have practiced Silat and our uh, our youngest son uh, is, a, is a black belt in, uh, in Taekwondo. So Amazing. It's just, uh, that's, awesome. that's wonderful to hear. Uh, well, well, Jennifer Raff, thank you for helping us gain knowledge through the lens of creativity here on Artful Science. Thank you so much, Aaron.